becoming one flesh, there is possible to build between them a bond of unity that cannot possibly be established any other way. It's, an, it, it's a bond of deep emotion that is connected with a physical joy that is insurmountable and unimaginable. And it's only that, that when that is assembled and that is there that you've got this thing called a man cleaving to his wife and they become one flesh. Well, which is it? Is it like Rashi or is it like the Ramban? Is it that by cleaving together and becoming one flesh they end up with a baby? Or is it that by cleaving together one flesh they become united with deep emotional unbreakable bonds? Which is it? Well, obviously both. Are they both part and connected and joined? Well, it wasn't thought so actually until uh, fairly recently. And, um, uh, and so I hope what I'm about to say doesn't impact anybody personally in any way whatsoever. But um, interestingly enough, for years during the 60s when the uh, vasectomy operation became popular, it was marketed to sexually liberated America as saying, hey, instead of just making sex the problem of the woman, so is that men just say, hey, honey, have you remembered to take your tablet as of two, uh, 1962? You want to be a good guy? You can do your part as well. You just have a vasectomy. And it's not going to make any difference to the act at all. All it means is you're not going to have children, that's all. And that's what you're trying to avoid anyway in the first place. You're trying to separate sex from reproduction, which is a part of modernity. So go ahead. And so guys went ahead and did that. And it wasn't until fairly recently, not until the 80s, that all of a sudden the terrible truth began to emerge. And men started writing, and these were not men of religion or men of faith or men of tradition. I'm speaking about pretty reprehensible and depraved characters like the author Norman Mailing, who wrote, and he says, I was misled, I was lied to, I was deceived. They told me that the physical joy of the act is not impacted by vasectomy. All that's going to be impacted is fertility. He says, they lied to me by removing even the possibility of an eternal significance to the act, they did change the pleasure completely. So finally, in 1980, Norman Mailer came up with something which Rashi and the Ramban, when you put them together, had very clear a thousand years ago which is that you can't separate. Yes, obviously not every act of man cleaving to his wife is going to result in a child, but the fact that that potential is conceivably there, even if they choose at the present time to take steps to avoid it, but it's not permanent. The, the act is still filled with eternal significance. It changes everything. So Rashi is right and the Ramban is right. They're both exactly right. The two belong together. You can't separate that. And a little bit later on, we come to a very complicated part where the man and the woman disobey the boss and they eat something that they're not supposed to eat and out of that comes certain reactions and one of the reactions is that um, God says to the woman, well now there's a consequence. You are now going to give birth in pain. Up till now, pain, childbirth was a pleasure. All of a sudden, it's now going to have to be painful. And she says, oh, that's absolutely terrible, terrible. Well, I, I want to atone. What can I do to make it good? And God says, well, we're not going to change it. That pain is going to be there. However, I am going to add in a compensation. Since your regret is genuine and your remorse is authentic, your atonement is for real, here's the result. The result is I'm going to make it possible for you to be so in love with your husband and for you to feel that he is worthy of your respect. And that's going to make all the difference. And so being able to have a child with a man like that whom you admire so much, even though it's painful, will still be good. Now, the reason I tell it to you like this is because I want you to understand that there's a lot of misinformation. A lot of people think that this is part of God's punishment to Eve. You know, you're going to give birth in pain, childbirth is going to be very sore, and on top of that, your husband will rule you. Now, in Hebrew, the word is hu yim sholbach. That doesn't mean that he will brutalize you. It doesn't mean he'll be a tyrant. 
It means that only with your willing participation will he be your leader. You will want him to be. I mean, ladies, how long does it take you to get tired of a guy who, no matter what you say, he always says, whatever you want, dear? Isn't that infuriating after a few decades? No, it's infuriating early. I mean, um, I've got daughters who will not go out with guys who can't lead. If a guy picks a, a daughter of mine up for a date and says, where do you want to go? He's, he's, he's toast. He gets kicked to the curb. He doesn't even know that the whole evening's a waste of time. He may as well drop her off at home already. It's going nowhere. What do you want to do? No, she wants to be told, I'm picking you up at five o'clock and uh, bring uh, sneakers and sporting gear because we're going to be uh, hiking or whatever. Okay, fine, now I know where what it is. And if I don't like hiking, I'll tell him that. But at least he's taking the lead. That is what God is saying to him. Okay, fine, yes, can't help the pain in childbirth. That's going to happen, but... I'm going to set up the relationship between you so as you are going to feel delightful by being possessed by a man worthy of your admiration. Okay, so he's happy now. Now God turns to Adam and says to him, ha -ha, because of what you did, the earth is no longer going to be like the Garden of Eden. Thorns and thistles are what you're going to eat. Adam does atonement. He apologizes. He prays to God. And God says, well, I'm not going to change the fact that you're going to have to work hard for a living now, but I'll tell you what I will do. I will give you a gift that is going to be unique to human beings, so you never need to think of yourself as being animalistic, because after all, I told you not to eat that, you went and ate it. You're just like an animal. Whatever you saw, you eat. Well, there's a way out of that enigma. You can really be somebody special, a unique creature on the planet. I'm going to give you unique special food. It's called bread. And so the sweat of your brow, I can't change. That you're going to have to do. But the result is that when you do give sweat of your brow, you won't have to just eat radishes and carrots. You can eat something called bread. Adam says, what's bread? That's a different story. But that's part of the response. And so the entire relationship emerges. All the rules and structures of marriage come out of this in a very beautiful way. And later on, when Adam and Eve have children, they have Cain and Abel. And what does Eve say? Because I have acquired a man, I'm going to call him Cain. But here's what you need a rabbi for. Because you've got to know the Hebrew. And what you've got to know is that the word Cain in Hebrew means acquire. And so when she says, I have acquired a man and I'm going to therefore call my son Cain, that's what, the same word. So Cain's entire personality is one of being acqui acquisi acquisitive. But then what does Eve mean when she says, I have acquired a man because of my son? means her husband. And that allows us to draw out another permanent principle about marriage. And all of these things, when you infiltrate us, teach this to the barbaric savages, their lives are going to change. What do you mean? Well, look at what Eve is saying. The principle that is coming out of the story. This is not just a mindless children's story. This is a powerful principle. The principle is that a wife's most powerful commitment must be to her husband, not her children. It goes against all instincts. And the, 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 the humorous literature of America and the comedies on television are filled with the image of the husband feeling neglected after the arrival of the... Everybody knows that. But not among the team of infiltrators. Because they know how it ought to work. And that the greatest gift you can give your children is a strong, happy, joyful, healthy marriage. And if your children have to spend two days with grandma or Aunt Agatha while you and your husband take some well-needed time alone, that's great. And the woman who says to her husband, no, I can't go away with you. What are we going to do with the kids? You're forgetting the message from Eve. No, 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 no. It's the man I'm acquiring here. And these principles are enormously important, and these are what lay the foundations. They're so important 
and, and so difficult to extract just from the English story as you read it because after the translations, year after year, as you can imagine, things deteriorate and you don't, you don't know what's really going on. And so because of our deep concern to make it possible for everybody to access this ancient Jewish wisdom, the essence of the Torah, you know, this by itself isn't just the Torah. You've got to have the oral transmission that goes with it, right? Because otherwise you end up with a danger that this is just stories. And so to give you an example of that, what we've done here is we've laid out um, two hours of these principles to make them accessible to people in audio form along with a study guide. This is called Madam, I'm Adam. We kind of like it because we imagined that that's what Adam said when God presented Eve to him. And she looked at him and he took off his hat, bowed low, and he said, Madam, I'm Adam. <laughs> and she said, oh, that's funny, it's a palindrome, it reads the same both ways. <laughs> Madam, I'm Adam, oh yeah, that's good. So they got off to a good start. And underneath it, it's decoding the marriage secrets of Eden. Right? Anybody whose marriage could use some of these principles? Yeah? You married? You could use some of these principles? Come right up. There you are. Use it. Why, tell, tell me some of the really bad things that go on in your marriage that you feel. <laughs> There I've tried to give you just a few of the examples of some of the principles that have to do with male-female relationships. Very essential, right? Things that you gotta know. If you want to effectively modify your lives and then impact the people around you so as the savages can become civilized, then you need to know about male-female relationships. But that's not the only thing we need to know about. We need to know about the principles of money as well. And so where do we start with that? Well, there are a few places. There are a few places we could begin. A good one might be Cain and Abel. Because what happens, interestingly enough, after Cain and Abel grow up, back to the manual, chapter 4, verse 8. You know how that verse begins? And Cain said to Abel. That's it. Doesn't say anything else. Well, wait a sec. Cain and Abel are in the field. Cain said to Abel, yeah, 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 tell me. What did he say? I want to know. Well, then you just have to consult ancient Jewish wisdom and check up with one of the transmitters. I don't have to tell you things that are obvious. I mean, this book is of limited size, you infiltrators. And once I get letting, let you loose on this island, I don't want you having to lug around the Encyclopedia Britannica. There's not going to be extra words here. Cain said to Abel, you figure it out. Okay, wait a sec. So how old are they at this point? Well, they're adults. Okay, wait a sec. So what, who else is in the world right now? Well, Cain and Abel and, and some sisters, apparently. And who else? Well, Adam and Eve. And how old is Adam at this point? Well, figure it out. You know, he's, he's probably about 920 years old at this point, getting on a little bit. Okay, so now we got a little bit of a hint of what the boys might be talking about. What do you think the two sons of a very wealthy industrialist who owns vast properties, what do you think those two sons might be thinking as their father ages? 